questers and friends. Happy 65th anniversary from your quester friends in Pennsylvania. The following video is a reproduction of the luncheon program, The Treasures of Best Bardens. Pamela Todd, a Pennsylvania quester, gave its first performance at the Questers International Convention in Hershey, Pennsylvania, May 3, 2009. The theme that day was to pay tribute and thank Jesse Elizabeth Bardens, the founder of Questers, on the organization's 65th anniversary. In response to numerous requests for a repeat presentation, the idea for a video surfaced. We will try our best to create the atmosphere so well received at convention. We especially want to thank the Communications Department of the Central Bucks South High School who made this filming possible. Did you ever want to know more about Quester's beginnings? Did you ever wonder about the history of the founder and want to know more about her? This became my goal and quest. As I used the Quester motto, it's fun to search and a joy to find. My name is Donna Caddick. I am a member of Salt Cellar Chapter 329, and I served as the luncheon chairman. Now sit back, relax, and imagine it's the day of the luncheon, and you have just been serenaded by the millionaire strolling strings. Oh yes, hats and gloves, ladies. You enter the luncheon ballroom and see 60 luncheon tables decorated with our Quester colors of blue and gold. On each table is a centerpiece doll in the likeness of our founder. The doll is elevated on a stand that displays our new Quester brochure and expresses what Bess believed in, learn, search, and preserve. She stands tall and looks down upon an antique. Yes, there is a treasure on every table, all donated by Pennsylvania Questers. A thank you card addressed to Bess accompanies each antique, and many cards include information about the item. We followed this idea because Bess used the term treasures frequently and said, sooner or later, the bug bites and you will collect something. Now you can see what she meant. Bess's granddaughter, Nancy Rink Kelly, attended the convention as our special surprise guest. She gave a wonderful talk on memories of her grandmother. Nancy recalled how her grandmother liked to entertain and loved a party. Bess did not miss her party that day, as we could all feel her presence. I hope you too can feel the presence of our founder as Pamela Todd allows the spirit of Jessie Elizabeth Bardens to pay her a visit as she again presents the programs, The Treasures of Best Bardens. In skies of blue with rainbow hue, dreams come true. My dream for a firmly established national organization came true in 1953 with the granting of our charter by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. What I am envisioning now for the year 2009 far exceeds any dream I've ever had for questers. But without imagination, we have no future. And besides, you didn't really think you could have a big 65th anniversary party without me, did you? And without memory, we have no past. And who would be without the beads of memory? Now, you probably already know that my name was Jessie Elizabeth Snyder before I married. At least that's what I thought. So imagine my shock when I applied for a marriage license and learned that the person I thought I was for 21 years did not even exist. 
not legally anyway. I learned that my name, in fact, was Ellen Cook. Yes, Ellen Cook, born January 24, 1887, Dodge City, Kansas. My mother died just two weeks after my birth, and my father was unable to care for me by himself. The Snyders, Aaron and Mary, were passing through town on their way to California. When they left Dodge City, they took a new baby girl with them, renamed me Jessie Elizabeth Snyder, and raised me as their own. But they never told me. And they never formally adopted me. I know that wasn't all that uncommon for those days, but that didn't make it any easier for me. In fact, it was very distressing. Oh, but I don't mean to sound as though I'm complaining. After all, they were wonderful parents who gave me every advantage, and I had a very happy childhood. Now, I met Mr. Bardens at a Fourth of July fireworks display. Rather auspicious, wouldn't you say? Little did I know then that I would be leaving my beloved California to go back east, and I would spend most of my married life in the Philadelphia area. We purchased our home in the suburbs of Philadelphia in 1922. It was a small neighborhood between Ambler and Fort Washington, known as Ambler Highlands. Although I suppose you've probably seen my address written as either Ambler or Fort Washington, because you see our post office was in Ambler until 1958. And when it changed to Fort Washington, my address became Ambler Highlands, comma, Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. Later, of course, it became simply Fort Washington. They tell me now hardly anyone even remembers Ambler Highlands anymore. But I do hope that at least my questers will keep that memory alive. For after all, Ambler Highlands is where questers began. It was wartime, summer of 42, and I had volunteered for the American Red Cross. I was the production corps chairman for the Ambler branch. Now, Ambler, mind you, not Philadelphia, as some may think. And one day, on a lunch break, I took a walk over to Main Street and happened by Mr. Gerhardt's antiques and secondhand store. It was one of my favorite shops. In fact, I bought several tea caddies there. One day, I overheard Mr. Gerhardt's teenage son refer to me as the tea caddy lady. And don't think my eye didn't go right to this tea caddy over here. The caddy, in all its changing beauty, can be regarded as a memorial to the former high price of tea. Oh, it's Tunbridge ware. It's lovely, isn't it? Two good friends and a cup of tea. One is you and one is me. Oh, but on this particular day, it wasn't a tea caddy that caught my eye, but rather an exquisite pale blue syrup jug, much the same size and shape as this one. It was embellished with beautiful white Grecian mosaics, highlighted by a unique handle formed by the head of Father Time with flowing beard. I paid 75 cents for it, 
carried it back to our Red Cross workroom in the basement of St. John's Lutheran Church. So many people stopped by to admire and inquire of it that I soon found myself telling them, 93 years ago, an artistic potter conceived this lovely object, and its beauty lives on. I saw a spark of light on their faces, causing the gloom of war to vanish momentarily. I often thought back to that day as the war dragged on, until one day in 1943, I conceived an idea of starting an antique study club as an avenue of escape from women's constant worries over loved ones across the sea. I invited 14 women to my home and asked each to bring an antique or two to share with the group. The suggested categories were silver, boxes, or quilts. Let's see, what do we have here? Oh yes, these will do nicely. For instance, someone might bring a couple of antique silver moat spoons. Aren't they delicate? Now, of course, you all know what moat spoons are, do you not? No? No? Oh, well, then maybe you should do some research. Well, after that, I explained exactly how everything was going to work. We would share our collections and do research and present study papers to the group. And then, in anticipation of a time when the war would be over and gasoline would no longer be rationed, we would be able to motor across the countryside visiting museums and historic homes and antique shops and the like. I told them that I had written a letter to a Mr. Charles Messer Stowe, who wrote an antiques column for the New York Sun called The Quester. And I had asked his permission to use the name Questers for our club. Well, Mr. Stowe sent back a most enthusiastic response, giving me permission to use the name, but he also cautioned me on several points. First, keep the meetings as informal as possible. And second, never let it become nothing but another social club. He had seen far too many other groups that had been forced to disband when they lost their learning purpose and became nothing but social clubs. I assured him that would not happen with my questers. Mr. Stowe is the quester in New York City. And of course, we will be questing in the countryside and we shall call ourselves the Countryside Questers. Everyone I invited came that day. Oh, except for young Peg Dando. It seems her baby Jenna got sick that day and she had to cancel at the last minute. Poor dear, she was so upset. But everyone else gave unanimous approval for everything. And so the Countryside Questers was born April 6, 1944, at my home at 512 Hartranf Avenue at the corner of Hartranf and Belair in Ambler Highlands, Pennsylvania. And I was elected the first president. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You thought that heritage was the first chapter. Well, yes. 
Well, every organization has growing pains, little bumps in the road, and Questers was no different. What I am about to tell you has never been written down and rarely discussed. After all, when you're trying to build a strong foundation for a growing organization, it makes no sense to air dirty laundry. And besides, I am not one to be dragged down by little bumps in the road. We learn from our disappointments and wiser move on to better things. So I kept my eye on my vision and kept moving forward. After some things I learned here today, it makes it a little easier to discuss. So for the sake of historic accuracy, I will speak of it just this once. You see, the countryside questers became so popular and grew so quickly that within just one year I had to start another club and then another and another and another until April 1949 I chartered the sixth club Heritage Questers. Okay. Now back then we were receiving a lot of publicity. Oh, Mr. Stowe gave us very generous publicity in his Quester column in the New York Sun. He even published some of our study papers. And from all this publicity, we gained national attention. Now, Mr. Bardens advised me that if I were going to continue to charter new clubs, I should first form some sort of central organization to bind them all together. Well, I had several clubs in progress at the time, but I put those on hold so that I could research how other organizations worked. And then I got together with my friend Dorothy, uh, oh, Mrs. Edward Lafferty, and together we consulted a lawyer. And then we formed the National Questers in March 19. In May, I went out to visit my six clubs to invite them to join my new national organization. And of course, the Countryside Questers was first, and oh, I couldn't wait to tell them exactly how everything was going to work. As a national organization, we are now ready to accept chapters from other states and we will grow and in time we will have annual meetings for all the chapter presidents and other officers and sometimes these meetings will be in the Philadelphia area and sometimes we will be required to travel to other states for these meetings. And we will continue to grow, and I envision a day when there will be a Quester chapter in every state in the country. Oh, I was so excited. And when I finished talking, they just sat there. Oh, I heard some mumbling in the back something about a done deal. Well, of course it was a done deal. I had done all the research, all the work. I had everything organized and ready to go. All they had to do was join. Well, then I heard some of them saying that they couldn't or wouldn't travel to other states to attend meetings and before I knew what was happening somebody was making a motion and they all voted no the countryside questers would not join the new national organization oh, I don't even remember what I said I was so 
angry and frustrated. They didn't even give it a chance. And they certainly did not share my vision. I just walked out. I went to club after club after club. No, no, no. Heirloom Questers, the fifth club, decided that they did not wish to pay the one dollar annual national dues. Nor did they wish to receive a national newsletter. They didn't even wish to write study papers anymore after just one year as a quester chapter. They just wanted to keep their money in their treasury and use it for visiting historic homes and museums and such in their local area, but they certainly did not wish to become federated. Heritage. Heritage Questers was the only one that said, yes, they would go with me. And I will never forget their fine loyalty and the faith that they had in me and in my vision for the future of Questers. It was decided that chapters would be numbered consecutively as they became chartered and joined my new national organization. And therefore, the club, Heritage Questers, had a rebirth in the new national organization and became Heritage, chapter number one of the National Questers. I quickly chartered Wissahickon Valley, number two, my new chapter, and Tredifra, number three, my daughter Elmira's chapter. Oh, you may know her better as Liz or Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barden's Rink. And I became the first governor of the National Questers, later to be called president. Governor didn't last very long. And I became extremely busy visiting chapters and chartering new ones. And oh, I remember one young lady who came to me and she wanted to start a new chapter, but she had moved to a new neighborhood and she didn't know anyone. So she asked me, um, Mrs. Bardens, how will I know who to invite? And I told her, my dear, simply go out and take a walk about your neighborhood at night when the lights are on and look in people's windows. If it looks like Wanamaker's department store showroom, keep walking. You will be able to see who has antiques and they are the ones you invite to your meeting. Many hours of pleasure are gained from the study and collecting of antiques because we learn of the historic backgrounds of the people who made and lived with them. But research, research, research before you buy. I remember once I was out in a shop in Wayne and I was rummaging through a box of old bedspreads and I came upon an old paisley shawl that I didn't buy. But a few weeks later, I was visiting a friend and didn't she have almost that exact same shawl hanging on her dining room wall? Well, she proceeded to tell me it's Scottish history and its value. Well, when I learned the value I rushed back to that shop in Wayne, but of course it was gone. Hasn't that happened to all of us? Then a few months later, 
I happened to be in that same shop again. And there it was. I could hardly contain my excitement as I carried it up to the clerk and asked what he would take for it. Well, <clears throat> yes, it does seem to be a little somewhat frayed. In fact, um, I'm not sure how much usable material is here. Well, he finally let me have it for $25, which I reluctantly paid. And then I fairly danced out of that shop, for its true value was closer to 1500 That was a real scotch bargain. It's what I call finding a sleeper. Well, you all know that my vision for Questers came to pass, and it grew into the fine international organization that it is today. I was overwhelmed and deeply gratified to learn of the Quester Scholarships and the Art Conservation Fellowship at Winter Tour, the headquarters building in Philadelphia, and the great expansion in the field of historic preservation with over $100,000 given out in international grants just last year. And when I learned that thousands, thousands of questers have traveled all across the United States and Canada to attend annual meetings and conventions, well, I just, I don't know what to say. It's truly a dream come true and so much more. Still, I always hoped that those first five chapters might reconsider and join my new organization. I honestly didn't give them more than a year or two on their own, but I did give them written permission to keep using the Quester's name. After all, they were first and they were organized as Quester's clubs. Oh, I'd read of their activities in the Ambler Gazette, right alongside articles about my national Questers. They even used some of our Questers as speakers at their meetings. Were there hard feelings? <laughs> Some, especially with the countryside questers, I think. After that last meeting, we didn't speak to one another for oh, maybe 10 years. And then one day, out of the blue, they called and invited me to a meeting. When I walked in the door, it was as if nothing had ever happened, as, as if we had just seen each other the day before. We talked and laughed, and we parted friends again. Oh, I did invite them to join again, all of them, several times. But they were content to just keep meeting individually. But we questers possess curiosity, do we not? So I couldn't miss this opportunity. I just had to ask Mrs. Caddick if she possibly knew what happened to my first five clubs. I was stunned to learn that the countryside questers continued to meet right up through the turn of your new century. Nearly 60 years together as a club, until they dwindled down to just one last member. <laughs> Young Peg Dando. 
the one who missed the very first meeting because her baby was sick. Oh, Mrs. Caddick tells me, baby Jenna is a quester now, a member of Quaker Bonnet 876 for over 15 years. And she says that she has been reminded all her life that she was the reason her mother missed the very first quester meeting. And as for young Peg, well, she donated the original Countryside Questers gavel to Questers headquarters in Philadelphia, along with her scrapbook. And when she was finally forced to disband the Countryside Questers, she joined Bluebell number 82. Oh, I know I won't live long enough to see this day, but it does give me some measure of satisfaction to have this opportunity to peek into the future and see that at least one of my countryside questers will finally join my new organization, even if it does take over 50 years for it to happen. They tell me Peg is 97 years old now, the last of the original 15 questers. Heirloom questers. The fifth club, still in existence today, meeting for over 60 years, 20 members strong. <laughs> and I thought they were going to turn into just another social club. But they kept their learning purpose. Even if they don't write study papers. No one seems to know what happened to Wayside, Treasure, or Town and Country. In retrospect, perhaps we each achieved what we wanted. Over the years, I have received countless letters from questers from all across the country thanking me for starting the questers. I was deeply gratified to learn that after 65 years, you will still be writing these letters of thanks to me. I hope that you too will make it a hobby and go out and spread quester enthusiasm among all your friends and neighbors. May you have many happy hours of questing. For you are the treasures of Best Bardens. In skies of blue with rainbow hue, dreams come true. <laughs>